Oh, let's rejoice. It's a good day to be in God's house. It's a good day to be anywhere. Uh, as we continue our summer sermon series, God on Film, uh, today's sermon is, is going to be on the film How to Train Your Dragons. Now, it's a classic story of good and evil. All right, who took my sermon and put blank pages up here? It ain't funny. I don't appreciate it one bit. I'm trying to get up here and give a message. And y'all doing messing with me like this. It ain't funny. And so I want you to grab your sermon notes because we're going to talk about anger and outbursts of anger today. If you'll grab this little piece of paper right here. One of the dragons, of, and it's supposed to be shock and awe. You're not supposed to laugh at that. My aching back. <laughs> Can't intimidate anybody. I'll tell you what. If you like to fill in the notes, you can follow along and fill in notes. If you don't, you can just listen and carry on with us. But uh, we're going to talk about anger. And uh, we've identified five types of anger. And, and so as I go through my sermon and give you the five types of anger, what I do not want you to do is nudge the person beside you when you hear their anger. You are to listen for your own type of anger. Let the Spirit work on your heart, not your husband, not your wife, not your kids, okay? You know, and I know I'm going to see some guy jump, oop, okay, that's what she thinks he's got. That's got that elbow right in the ribs. All right, now we're going to talk first about the raging dragon. That's the one I tried to show you. A raging dragon is somebody that flies off the handle so easily. Proverbs 29, 11 says, a fool gives full vent to his spirit full vent doesn't hold back at all but a wise man quietly holds it back we would say that they've got a hairpin trigger on their anger there's yelling there's throwing things there's an outburst and it's a lot of times it's unexpected a lot of times this this outburst comes from left field you did not see it coming did not know what was happening and, and if you're the recipient of a raging dragon you might be the person that goes why are you taking that out on me? There was a little boy who had a raging dragon of a temper. And his dad had dealt with him and tried to work with him through that. And so he finally came up with an idea. He's what I'm going to do. Every time you lose your temper, every time you fly off the handle in a rage, I want you to take this, this bag of nails and this hammer. I want you to go out to the back 40 and I want you to nail one nail in that fence. All right, Daddy. The first day. 17 nails in the fence. Didn't like nailing in the fence because he had to walk all the way out there. It's hot doing this nailing. Every day he got a little better and a little better. Fewer nails, fewer nails. Till finally, a few weeks into this project now, the little boy comes up to his daddy. He says, Daddy, I didn't have to put any nails in there today. I am so proud of you, son. I am so happy that you're learning to control your temper. That's a great thing. What I want you to do now is every day that you go all day, Without getting angry like that, you go pull out one nail. And so the days and the weeks went on, and finally he got all the nails out. And he came to his dad and said, Daddy, I did it. I, I, I hadn't been angry in so long. I haven't had an outburst. I got all the nails out. Good. And he takes his little son by the hand. Let's walk down to the fence. I want you to look at the fence. No nails, right? No, Daddy, no nails. But every time you got angry and every time you put a nail in that fence, you left a hole. You have still got holes in this fence. And your anger puts a hole in someone's spirit every time you fly off the handle at them. And those don't go away. Number two, our second dragon, is the silent dragon. Psalms 55 says, His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. This is the person that bottles up their anger. Uh, there's two types of silent dragons. You've got a repressor and a suppressor. Now, a repress, excuse me, yeah, a repressor, they're going to hold their anger inside. This is the person that's going to have ulcers because they just never let it out. They hold it, they suppress it, they get repress it. It's not coming out. And maybe other ailments, other illnesses come out because they take that stress and anger and just keep stuffing it. But a suppressor will pretend it's not there. Oh, that didn't bother me. Oh, I'm not so worried about that. That's no big deal. And what happens with a suppressor is they can only hold it down for so long. And then something's going to trigger that anger and, and that resentment that is festered and grown is going to blow up on you. The third type of dragon of anger is the passive-aggressive dragon. Proverbs 26, 18, 19 says, Like a madman who throws firebrands, 
arrows and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I'm only joking. Have you ever been put down really hard, maybe at work, and they go, oh, I'm just kidding with you. You see it a lot on, on Facebook. You get slammed on Facebook and you say, JK, just kidding my eyeballs. It's kind of like, Woo, look at that baby. That baby's born so ugly. Bless his heart. Have mercy. There was a, uh, this person, the passive aggressive dragon, can, can, is really clever. They'll have those snarky remarks, you know. They like to heap guilt on you. Or they might do the other way. They might use the passive side and just ignore you. Give you the silent treatment. I tried that. My wife loved it. <laughs> I guarantee you, when the time is right, they're going to ambush you if they're passive aggressive. You're going to think everything's okay, but no. To illustrate, I read a story about, uh, that Pastor Ray Steadman told. It was during the Korean War and some Amer Americans there. They weren't close to the action. They were back far enough that they could get a house and rent a house. and They could hire one of the little Korean boys to come in and clean the house and cook for them and do things like that. Now these army guys, they were typical guys. They were pranksters. They were just having fun. They were joking around with their little Korean boy, uh, young, little young man there. And, and so what they would do is they would put Vaseline on the stove and he'd come in and get grease on his hands. He never said a word, never complained. They'd put the old, the old joke about the bucket of water up on the door and he'd get doused. Never said a word, never complained. Even one day he was asleep there and they nailed his shoes to the floor. For so long, he took this without any complaints or saying anything back. They started feeling guilty. And they finally came up to him and said, look, no, we're really sorry about all these tricks we've played on you. And, and, and we want to apologize and we're not going to do it anymore, okay? And the houseboy says, no more sticky on stove? Nope, no more. No more water on door? Nope, never again. No more nail my shoes to floor? No, sir, we're not going to ever do that again. Okay. I no more spit in your soup. Passive aggressive. <laughs> Number four, when you least expect it, you got to watch those. Number four is the pouting dragon. A man stirs up wrath. A man of wrath stirs up strife, but one given to anger causes much transgression. The pouting dragon. This person's the life of the party. Uh, no, the life of the pity party. It's all about me. I want you to feel sorry for me. Oh, it's horrible. They don't want to fix whatever's wrong. They just want to be the center of attention. They want to pout and just get sympathy all they can. Uh, it is truly a, a type of anger. And now this is, this, is, this is the one I don't like. Number five is the sarcastic dragon. Sarcastic. But I say to you from Matthew that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the fire of hell. The sarcastic dragon leaves a deadly wound. They're calm on the outside. They're really good with using words to get even. Have you ever known someone like that? Man, they can come up with a jab just like that, and you're, and you're three hours later going, oh, I should have said this. But they never miss that chance to get right back in there with that jab. And it hurts, and they cut you deep with those words. Cutting remarks. They want to make you feel worthless. That's how they feel better. James 1.26 says this, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, his religion is worthless. Now, can you imagine that time that you gave that jab if you're the sarcastic dragon and the Lord God's word says your religion is worthless when you don't control your tongue. If you've got any of these five dragons in your spirit, if you keep letting these dragons take over your emotions, the danger is you're pushing people away from you every time you give in to this. Anger leads to even more destructive types of habits. Uh, abuse, addictions, revenge, murder. You've got to deal with this anger. You've got to weed it out so you don't make bigger mistakes in your life down the road. Anger is not good. Uh, unresolved anger, it's an emotional and a spiritual issue. It'll eat you alive. And every one of those five dragons not only hurts you, but it hurts the people around you. I like the way the Roman philosopher Seneca said it. Anger is like an acid that does more harm to the vessel where it's stored 
than to the one on whom it's poured. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, that's worth saying again. Anger is like an acid that does more harm to the vessel where it's stored than to the one on whom it's poured. You know what? Angry people are not happy people. And the people who live with or are around angry people have a hard time being happy people. You live life walking on eggshells, on pins and needles. What am I going to say that's going to set her off next? That's going to set him off next? What's going to happen? I don't want to see this. I don't want to be here. Ecclesiastes 7, 9 says, Don't be quick-tempered, for anger is a friend of fools, is one interpretation of it. Now, what am I going to do about it? If I've identified myself, and hopefully you've seen yourself, not hopefully, but righteously, you're going to see yourself, because I've identified at one time or another in my life, I've been all five. Maybe one doesn't overpower the others, but I can see when I've pouted. <laughs> I can see when I've been sarcastic. I'm glad Susan's not here to give an amen, so that's good. I can see when I've flown off the handle. And you could probably recognize times in your life like that too, but what do you do about it? I've got four biblical steps to control your temper, or four steps on how to train your dragon. Number one thing you want to do is identify what triggers my anger. What's my trigger? What is the issue that sets me off like no other? Or who is the person that really knows how to push my buttons? And the person that knows how to push my buttons also knows what my issues are, and they love to push my buttons. So you've got to recognize that trigger and figure out what it is, and then we can talk about what to do with it. Identify your trigger. Now, just because somebody knows how to push your buttons, and so they know how to pull your trigger, that does not justify you in raging back at them or using one of these dragon types to get back with them. You control your trigger. Proverbs 19 says this, verse 11, Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it's to his glory to overlook an offense. You ever had to overlook an offense? It's to your glory to overlook that offense. And guess what? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have the ability to control your anger. Oh, no, man. I, I, I set off just like, no, you, know, you don't. You do. Guess what it says? When we're baptized, who do we receive? Which person of the Trinity? Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit. And I, I've, I've read that the Holy Spirit gives us gifts, right? And he also, now gifts, he doesn't give all the gifts to everybody, right? Not everybody has the same gifts, but everyone is to exhibit each of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And I seem to remember one of those being called self-control. So God has given you and me what we need to exercise self-control. Now it's up to us to decide whether we're going to use what God gave us. But I like flying off the handle. I don't want to use self-control, you know. Sorry, it's not an option. James says this also. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Can't happen. When you lose your temper, you always lose. Number two on how to control our dragon. Pause and pray when you feel your temper rising. This is a hard one. Because the natural thing, the human nature thing is, you jab me, I'm going to have one coming right back at you. You tick me off, I want to just tick you right back off, you know. It's just human nature. But we use the Spirit to control that human nature. We pause for a second. And we pray. This is most valuable if you have small children. Go, go with me on this. Have you ever punished your child instead of disciplined your child? Have you ever waited until you were so mad at what they were doing that you got angry and you spanked them? See, spanking is not discipline. Discipline is discipline. I read a book, uh, Train Up Your Child. It's a really good little book. And it says you should train, you should discipline quickly and without anger. You did something wrong? Come here. Pop! Oh, I just love you. But you've got to be disciplined. But what we do is we go, you better quit that. You better stop that. You better not do that anymore. I'm telling you the last time, you better quit that. That's one. That's two. That's 20. And then we rip into them with a belt or a switch and we let them have the full wrath of our anger. And that's not discipline. Discipline is quick and calm. It can be the same way with, uh, with grown-ups, too. If we get angry when we respond, that's not right. Pause and pray. 
Next time you're in traffic, Pastor Ed said, pause and pray. Don't give them that single finger salute. You pause and pray. Now, what's going to happen now is after, after somebody ticks you off and you pause and pray and you don't respond you know, with anger, after a while, you're going to start thinking about it again, aren't you? You're going to start dwelling on it again. You're going to think about what they said. It's going to make you mad again. What do you got to do again? Pause and pray. Don't let it fester. All right. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, Proverbs 14. But he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Now, if you've got a quick temper, you need to go to number three. Repair the damage caused by my anger. Repair the damage. God doesn't want broken relationships to stay broken. Have you ever hurt someone with your anger? Have you ever been hurt by someone else's anger? There was a story I read about a merchant. It's been several years ago that they had a department store and he raised up his two boys identical twins as as workers in this merchant store and when the merchant became ready to retire he wanted the boys to run the store and they thought great you know identical twins we see a good thing you know the double doubles and they're going to run the store and they're going to go through it and everything but what happened one day was these boys ran it fine until one day one of the brothers did a transaction he, he laid a twenty dollar bill on the cash register and he walked out the person that just bought something carried up and carried it out to the store and when he came back the 20 was gone well first thing he did was look to his brother hey i put a 20 on the register what'd you do with it i don't know what you're talking about there was a 20 right there it didn't walk away by itself and it escalated the human nature just kicked in they got angry at each other and it went on and on and on neither one would admit they could be wrong no possibility of being wrong it got so bad they built a wall right down the middle of the store you sell stuff on this side of the wall, I'll sell stuff on this side of the wall. 20 years later, a man comes in the store, drives up to the front, and he says, how long have you been here? Talking to the gentleman on this side. I've been here since the store opened. It's my dad's store. I got a confession, man. 20 years ago, I was homeless. I was riding the rails. Some people called it a hobo. And I got off a boxcar, and I came in through the back door when nobody was looking, and I saw a 20 on the red shirt, and I took it. And it's bothered me so much, man. I, I, I've got a job now. I've got a family. I, I just wanted to make it right. And I wanted to come say I'm sorry. And the guy kind of kind of teared up in his eyes, you know. And he said, I want you to come over here to the other side of the store and tell, tell this man that same story. And so he told him that story. And the gentleman had no idea that why these two guys were hugging like they were with tears rolling down their eyes. Their relationship had been repaired. One that didn't really need to have been dissolved over a $20 bill. A dividing wall. Matthew 5 says this. But I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. When it says leave your gift at the altar, it's saying fix it quick. Come to terms quickly. Before it's too late to mend that relationship, you do whatever you can to make it right with whoever you've offended or who has offended you. It's become a spiritual issue with two people now. And if you hurt somebody or they hurt you, now you've got somebody probably wanting revenge. And i got to wonder, how can I come to church on Sunday and praise a God who wants to forgive me all of my sins if I won't forgive my brother or my friend or my coworker? Maybe right now you remember somebody like that. Maybe a name popped in your head. Go make it right. Do what you can to fix that situation. Leave your sacrifice. Make it right. You've got a broken relationship with you and it's, it's hurting your relationship with God. Now, unfortunately, your apology will not fix all relationships. There's some people who don't want your apology, don't want to forgive you, don't want any part of it. They want to stay mad at you. But guess what? God only says, I want you to deal with your heart. I want you to do what I tell you to do. You don't worry about if they forgive you. You don't worry about what their response is. That's my job. I'm God. And God says, you, I'm worried about your heart. I want you to do what I need for you to do. And then you go and you do what God puts on your heart to do, and you leave the rest to God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. The fourth and final step in learning to train your dragon of anger is to respond with love. Don't react in anger. If you respond in love and not react in anger, there's a, whole, there's a real good possibility you'll never have to do step three. 
You'll never have to go fix what's wrong. You'll never have to go repair a broken relationship. Proverbs 15, a gentle answer turns away wrath. But I want to give him a zinger. I really do want that zinger. You know, no, a gentle answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. Anger is a sin which always reproduces. It likes company. And so it wants you to be angry too. It creates a deadly cycle. Vengeance feels good and sells a lot of movies. Name, name one movie based on vengeance. What? Die Hard. Yeah, that's a good one. Charles Bronson, remember his movies from yesteryear? Those of us that are not quite as young as we used to be? He was all about the, the vengeance, you know? Uh, what does it say in Romans 12? If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with everyone. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it's written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And then comes one of those scriptures we really don't like to read, okay? To the contrary. If your enemy, your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. As far as it lies within you, as much as in you lies, live at peace with all men. Now, there is a time to get angry, all right? I think our next picture illustrates this. I saw this on, on Rachel's uh, Facebook, and I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. It said, uh, when you ask what would Jesus do, remember that grabbing a whip and turning over tables is not out of the question. Because here, he is turning over uh, tables of the money changers. And what the story behind this is, he's not just getting mad because people are selling stuff in church. What the scholars tell us and what they believe is happening is here, they're selling faulty animals. What kind of animal should you give to God when you give a sacrifice back in the Old Testament? A perfect animal. Well, I'm going to sell you my broken-legged lamb for twice what it's worth instead. Or I'm going to have a bad rate of exchange. Basically, these guys were ripping people off in church. And Jesus said, that's not happening in my father's house. I'll run you out. Another time that he intervened uh, was, you remember when uh, those guys found this woman in the act of adultery? And I've always wondered exactly what were they doing to catch her in the act of adultery. Where, what windows were they peeping in? I, I think it was a setup myself. But anyway, these guys catch this woman in the act of adultery, and they bring her out there before Jesus, and they're wanting to stone her to death, and they're flipping rocks. And they're going, okay, Jesus, what about this girl? What do we do now? And he says, okay, all right, you want to stone her to death? Whichever one of you has no sin in your life, you chuck the first rock. And then he leans down on the ground, and he starts writing. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us what he writes, but we all know. We all know it was the name of the guys that those guys cheated with, right? It was the girl those guys were cheating with. You know, if, uh, if Fred was hanging out with Irene, it's Irene went in the ground. Fred dropped his rock and left. You know, no offense, Fred. It's different Fred. So, but that's, that's just a theory. That's just because we all know who would have got stoned if Fred done that, right, Connie? <laughs> uh, he intervened. Jesus intervened because those hypocrites wanted to kill her. Now, I find it unusual, though, that he would intervene for her. He would intervene for his father's house. But when he was on trial, he remained silent. He was illegally arrested. He did not resist. Simon Peter pulls out his sword, whacks off Malchus's ear. Jesus picks that ear up, puts it back on, and heals it. Jesus stands before the religious court of the Sanhedrin. Never defended himself to the religious leaders. They said, send him to Pilate. Didn't defend himself. Pilate says, oh, the king Herod's here. He'll get a kick out of seeing Jesus. Silence. Didn't say anything in his own defense. He could have. He could have said things that probably would have gotten him off the hook. But if he had gotten off the hook, he wouldn't have died for your sin and my sin. It says he set his face like flint. That means I'm determined to go to the cross so that my children who I created can be redeemed through faith in my sacrifice. He responded with love. He did not react in anger. And then when those soldiers took and beat him and whipped him and put that crown of thorns in his head, and he's just, oh man, the, the movie, the, the Passion of the Christ was so graphic. His back just a pulp of blood and hamburger meat looking. It's just horrible. And they put him on that, that cross and they lift him up. He could have called 10,000 angels just like the song says, but he didn't. He responded with love he didn't react with anger and he said, Father, forgive them. 
they don't know what they're doing. And it's through faith in His sacrifice that we get to make the great exchange. It's through faith in what He did for us that we can trade our anger for His peace and our frustration for God's joy. This is not being weak, people. This is expressing our trust in a loving God. And Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Amen.